Good morning. It's a bright morning, isn't it? Yeah. So I'll ask us to please rise. So I'm reminded of uh, in the Old Testament when the children of Israel will be told, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. And today I will say, Hear, O LVC, our God is one. Amen? And we will proclaim this in this song that He is God alone. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can do by your plans. That's just the way it is. See, you are not a God. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can do by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone. You are God alone from the old time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone Right now And right now In the good times and bad You are on the throne You are God alone You're the only God You're the only God Whose power None can contend You're the only God Whose name and Praise will never end You're the only God Who's worthy of everything we can do You are God That's just the way it is You are God alone From before time began You are on your throne You are God alone and right now And right now In the good times and bad You are on your throne you are God alone. You are God alone. You are God alone. From before time began, you are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. Unchangeable. You're unchangeable, unshakable, or unshakable, unstoppable, or unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable, you're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable, you're unchangeable, you're unshakable, you're unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable. You're unchangeable. You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You are God alone. You are God alone. From before time began, you are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. You are God alone. You are God alone. From before time began, you are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. You are God alone. Amen. Amen. He is the most high God.
cannot be compared to anyone else. of men but you are but you are the most high God there is none like you all other gods all other gods they are the works of men but you are the most high God there is none like you Jehovah, you are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. You are the Most High God. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. Jehovah, you are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. You are the Most High God. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy is forever. Hallelujah. Jehovah, you are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. Jehovah, you are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. You are the most high God. Jehovah, you are the most high. You are the Most High God. Amen. Oh Lord, we in recognition of the fact that you are the Most High God. Give us the grace to lay down our crowns, thrones we have made, and things that have taken our hearts, so that we may bow to no other God but you. We fall down, we 
lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, 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 and we cry, holy, 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 and we cry, holy, 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 he is the Lamb. We fall down. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. He's the Lamb. We cry, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. He's the Lamb. that you are faithful you're not a man that you should lie nor a son of man that you should change your mind you're the God who speaks and acts you're not the God who promise and not, not fulfill how sweet it is to trust in you so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know that saved the Lord Jesus 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 how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more.
oh how sweet to trust in jesus just to trust his cleansing blood and in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood jesus 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 how i trust him how i proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him more yes tis sweet to trust in jesus just from sin and self to cease just from jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and jesus 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 how i trust him how i proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him more I'm so glad I learned to trust him precious Jesus Savior friend and I know that thou art with me Wilt be with me to the Jesus, 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 how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him Jesus, 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 how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. In the same spirit, let's read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 to 12. And you, Lord, lay the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, you will be changed, but you are the same and your ears will have no end. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we want to thank you. We are so happy that you have enabled us to see this wonderful morning. Father, we surrender this service unto thy bow hand. May you bless us, O Lord. May your presence be together with us. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, do we pray and believe. Amen. We can have our seat. Good morning, LVC. If you're happy and you know, say amen. Hey, 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 did we take breakfast? If you're happy and you know, say amen. This side, this side I'm not hearing. If you're happy and you know, say amen. If you're happy and you know, say amen. Wow. Welcome all to our service today. My name is Sonny Ouma, and um, can you hear me? Yes, um, and today I'll be the service coordinator. Cindy? 
Can you hear me? Say amen. Amen. Do we have visitors are visiting us for the first time? We are not going to embarrass you, I promise. Just wave. Yes, you can see. Let's appreciate them. Let's welcome them. We can do better than that. Let's appreciate them. Wow, wow. We have some few highlights uh, in church. And uh, the first one is the women ministry is inviting all women of LVC to a walk at Aboretum. Women A. Eh? Women A. Eh? Wow, you are all invited to uh, the walk, which will be on 16th, which is next Saturday, from 9 to 10.30. So um, the qualification is just come and walk with, uh, with the women, and I believe you're going to be blessed. So the next highlight um, that we have is, after the service, we are going to have tea. That's where you clap once. That's where you clap once. And it's not just this after this service, but for the next, um, for this month of July. Now that's where you clap twice. <laughs> wow, wow. So we are so happy. Thank you, church, uh, for organizing, uh, organizing that. For sure it has been called, yes? Has it been called? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, so at that juncture, I would just want to pray for um, our kids and youth as they will be going to their places uh, to uh, Sunday school. So let's pray for our kids and the youth. Father, we thank you. Uh, we bless you this day. Thank you for the gift of the children, O oh Lord, that you have given unto us. The gift of the youth, O oh Lord, of this church, Lord. Even as they will be going to their various places, O oh Lord, to learn your word. May you bless them, O oh God. Bless even the teachers that will be teaching them. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, do we pray and believe. So we can release our children and the youth as they go to their places. You can say hi to the person sitting next to you. Thank you. Let's stand together. Lord, I come and I confess Bowing here I find my rest Without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Well, sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, and where, where you are, Lord, I Christ in me, where you are, Lord, where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, Lord, I need you, Lord, I need you, oh, I
righteousness, oh God, how I need And teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and strength. Teach my song. To teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and strength. When I cannot stand. When I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and strength. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My My one defense, Lord. My one defense. My righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. You're my one defense. My one defense. My righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Have your seats. Thank you. Check. Hello. Good morning. Am I? Am I on? I am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, worship team. Uh, good morning, LVC. My name is Isabella. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'd like to invite us to a time of corporate prayer. So let's pray. Our great and awesome God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning for who you are. You are great and greatly to be praised. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the wild wind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Our Lord, we pray for all those in our body who find themselves in various wild winds and storms. May this knowledge of your might, of your ability to walk in the storm, of your power and greatness, such that the clouds that are so high for us are the dust of your feet, may this bring comfort and faith as we lift our hands and hearts to you. God of mercy, we confess that many times in our joys or sorrows, we turn away from you and seek the solace of entertainment. Instead of seeking the fellowship of our brothers and sisters, we hide ourselves. And instead of persevering in prayer, we dive into our phones and television. Like the man in Proverbs, our folly brings us pain, and then our hearts rage against you. Forgive us, merciful God, and restore us. Remind us who you are. Remind us who we are. Let us remember joy. Wake us up to the sun, to your glory all around us, and how you invite us to enjoy you by glorifying you. Sovereign God, we pray on behalf of a broken, groaning world. We pray, O oh God, that you will alleviate the pain and suffering in Yemen because of the humanitarian crisis. Good Shepherd, remember the many refugees and immigrants across the globe. We pray for an end to the wars, the poverty and human rights abuses that drive desperate people to become refugees. 
Lord, may the global church be strong and compassionate, following your lead in seeking justice and mercy on their behalf. We also pray for relief, Lord, for the drought that's devastating the northern parts of Kenya and neighboring Ethiopia and Somalia. God of creation, please send rain and good harvests. Lord, restore global food supply chains and alleviate the suffering of your creation. Prince of Peace, we pray for peace between Ukraine and Russia. Peace in Japan with the current elections. Peace in the DRC and Rwanda and so many other hotspots in our world. King of Kings, we pray for our nation of Kenya. We pray for Kenya's leaders as, as your word teaches us to do. Would you grant them wisdom and courage to make hard decisions, to stand for justice and righteousness. Lord, as we look ahead to the elections next month, we continue to pray for free, fair, and peaceful elections. Let the different aspirants be respectful of each other, of the electoral process, of the Kenyan people, and ultimately of you as king. God of justice, expose evildoers who could be scheming against the peace and safety of our land and bring them to justice. We pray for the persecuted church from Nigeria to North Korea to Indonesia and elsewhere. God of all comfort, bring your peace to your people who are enduring suffering, imprisonment and even death. Give them the boldness and great assurance of your victory that will help them to hold fast to your testimony as you hold them fast. We pray for the unreached people groups around this world and on this continent, including the Nawila people of Kenya. We pray for literacy among these people to grow and that you would grant them an entire Bible in their own language. Would the gospel go forth in power among them, cause them to grow in faith and unity. Now church, let's each take a minute to go before God in silent prayer. Bear your heart before God. Pray for a brother or sister or family that comes to mind and ask God to prepare our hearts to receive his word. Now let's pray together the prayer our Lord taught his disciples to pray. You'll find it on the back of your song sheet. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite the scripture reader. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Exodus chapter 32, verse 1 to 14. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
go down because your people who whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a gulf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac and Israel, to whom you swore, you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I'll give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. That is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Elena. Great job. Good morning, church. My name is Jeremy, and I serve as one of the pastors here of LVC. To those of you who are visiting, most welcome to you. We'd love to meet you afterwards at the welcome table. But to everyone, welcome. So I don't know about you, but I love bonus features that are embedded in films. Anybody remember DVDs? You may still have a few like in boxes somewhere. Maybe you even still have a DVD player. But DVDs would have these special features or bonus features. You could even buy a streaming movie and they'll have them at the the end. And you may call them behind the scenes features. And I love these features where it, it has people who are involved in the making of the film, actors and the director, talking about how the film was made. Now often it's a little bit annoying because it's just actors gushing about each other. Like, oh, Lupita was so amazing to work with. She's just the consummate professional. Or Tom Cruise, how inspiring he was. I mean, the way he pretends to fly those fighter jets, just awesome. It's just kind of annoying how they just gush about their fellow actors. But I love it, especially when the director will show the making of the film and maybe even they'll have a special feature where they overlay on to the film as it's in the background, the director talking about how the film was made. Well, today as we enter into our final text in our Exodus series, we're going to take this approach whereby I want to walk us through scene by scene in these chapters, Exodus 32 to 34. And my hope is that by the end of this, that indeed we will rightly be able to gush about the main character in the story, and that character is God, is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of the church. And so today we enter into one of the most dramatic stories in the Old Testament. And so to enter into the drama and feel the weight of it, we're going to walk through the 10 scenes. And we're not going to give equal time to each of the 10 scenes, so so don't, don't get nervous here. But we're, we're going to pause the video, if you will, in key parts in order to observe what's happening and to consider what we might learn from this story. With this long story in these three chapters, as I said, we come to the close of our Exodus series. In case you're wondering, there are indeed six more chapters in Exodus, but we're not going to end with that. In fact, Pastor Joshua referred to them two weeks ago when he preached on the instructions that God gave to Moses about the tabernacle. Those final six chapters are lots of details, basically describing how Moses and the people followed those instructions. With the completed tabernacle, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, we're told in Exodus chapter 40. But guess what? That glory was almost lost. Why? How? 
because of the critical event in this Mount Sinai story that happens in chapters 32 to 34. So we end the, stories he, the story here because of what we learn about God and his relationship to his people and what it teaches us even today. If you've been following along in the series and you know the story a bit, you know that grace comes before law. I hope that point has sunk in, church. Grace comes before law. The Lord God had redeemed his people out of brutal slavery by sheer mercy and grace. It was nothing they deserved. The promise-keeping redeemer then brings them to this mountain to reveal his moral law, summarized in the Ten Commandments. It's like he's saying, I have liberated you and made you a people, my people. Now, here's the way, walk in it. But do they? No. And in fact, they fall horribly. With parallels to the creation story, many Bible commentators see this story as a kind of second fall of humanity. But it's not like they tripped and fell, which is often how we think about or how we talk about sin. No, here we see that they dove headlong into rebellion against their Redeemer and Savior and Lover. Tim Mackey from the Bible Project says this story is like someone cheating on their spouse on the actual wedding night. It's that bad. But here's the big idea from these three chapters. Rebellious idolatry will not have the last word. Rebellious idolatry will not stop God's plan for His covenant people. And LVC, what I hope to persuade you of and what I hope you walk away with today is this. Beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry because of the Lord's gracious compassion. Not flee from idolatry in order to earn God's gracious compassion. Rather, because of the Lord's gracious compassion, let us flee from idolatry. Are you ready to dive in? Okay, so beginning with what Elena read, the stage is set. And by the way, you have those first 14 verses there on your song sheet. And for the rest of Today's text, I urge you to follow along in either a, a print Bible or your phone app if you can avoid distraction. So the stage is set in scene number one. The people start to notice that Moses has taken a long time up there on the mountain. In fact, it's been 40 days and 40 nights, almost six weeks. Back in chapter 24, God had called Moses up there to receive the tablets of stone with the laws and the commandments that he had written himself for their instruction. So Moses had then told the 70 elders, the leaders of Israel, wait here until I come back to you. The Israelites could see the glory of the Lord on top of the mountain because it looked like a consuming fire. Quite dramatic, right? Well, now time is ticking away, and they even kind of dismiss Moses. Look at that, calling him this fellow Moses, like this guy Moses, this dude Moses. We, we don't know where he is. So now Aaron is leading in Moses' place. He's in charge while Moses is up there. So they gather around Aaron, and what they say is astounding. Well, there's so much that we could break down here in this first verse. What they say here and what they go on to do sets this whole thing up. It sets the whole thing up and it threatens the very destruction of God's people. We'll spend a bit more time here because of what this scene sets up. They break at least three of the Ten Commandments, which they had previously heard spoken from heaven 
and about which they clearly said in chapter 24, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. But now, look at what they say to Aaron in verse 1. Make us gods who will go before us. Wait, what? Small g gods? Commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Broken. Blatantly, flagrantly broken. Notice how they also say, this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt. But remember, before the Ten Commandments are even given, the first thing God speaks to them from heaven to all of them is this. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Church, right away we see how much sin brings confusion. Confusion about truth and reality and who is responsible for that. Well, does Aaron refuse and say, no, 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 Moses said he would be back. Let's be patient and wait for him. Besides, the thing you're asking me to do, I, I cannot do. In fact, the thing you're demanding me to do, because make no mistake, they are commanding their leader here. These are imperatives. And he gives in. Aaron tells them, give me your gold. And then he takes the time and the effort to cast that gold into an idol in the shape of a calf. Which, by the way, is not just some choice, some random choice of an animal. It's likely them reaching back to Egyptian deities that use these calves as symbols of potency and royalty. I was struck by what one, excuse me, one Bible commentator says about this event. Quote, even though the people had gotten out of Egypt, Egypt remained in the people, end quote. Commandment number two, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. Later, regarding idols and altars, God gets even more specific in chapter 20. Do not make any gods to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. So commandment number two, utterly broken. Can we just imagine for a second them looking up at this golden calf, worshiping it, and having the audacity to say there in verse four, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Parents, all of us know what it is like, whether the child is two or 12, you've watched your child do the exact opposite of what you've just told them not to do. The exact opposite. Managers, employers, though with adults, you've likely experienced this too. <laughs> Maybe it's even more infuriating. But for parents especially, with the mandate to reflect God to our kids... Did that blatant disobedience make you a bit angry? So if we're justified in feeling that righteous anger, how much more is God justified in feeling it? And yet, as we'll discuss more a bit later, we struggle with the notion of God's righteous anger, of God getting angry about disobedience. Now, in case you're wondering, wait, these people were enslaved for 400 years. How did they get enough gold to make this idol? Well, this is part of the hideousness of their idolatry here. If you're familiar at all with the Exodus story, you may remember that way back when God appears to Moses in the burning bush, he tells Moses that he will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people so that when they leave, they will not go empty-handed. They're to ask the Egyptians for gold and other items, and the Egyptians gave it. 
This was likely intended to be used for the tabernacle, the true place of worship for the one true God. And yet, this is what they do with it now. Commandment number three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. But look at verse five. Aaron sees what the people proclaim in verse four. So he actually builds an altar in front of the golden calf and announces that tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So wait, is Aaron now trying to recover the true worship of the one true God, of the Lord? No, I don't think so. Because he doesn't at all try to contradict or correct what the people say. Given his actual actions, it seems that he's here he's clearly misusing the name of the Lord, his God. LVC, let's be careful as a church that we don't get sucked into gimmicky, consumeristic forms of worship and somehow seek to endorse it by putting God's name on it. As a worship leader of sorts, Aaron clearly misuses the name of the Lord. And so the people respond to their interim leader. They make sacrifices and present offerings to this fake and false God. And then they begin a wild party. In the context of where they've come from in Egypt, the other ancient Near Eastern religions around them, and the kind of idol that is fashioned, this is undoubtedly something like a wild orgy. It's so wild that Joshua, somewhere halfway up the mountain, thinks it's the sound of war. Plus, for the first time, we learn that this massive group of people is not entirely isolated in the wilderness. There are other groups of people around them who can observe them. So when Moses finally sees this scene later in chapter 32, he observes that they are running wild, are out of control, and so have become a laughingstock to their enemies. To use the phrase by 19th century British pastor and author J.C. Ryle, here we see the utter sinfulness of sin. The sinfulness of sin. Behavior, yes. Blatant, flagrant, horrific behavior. And yet, listen to how the first martyr of the early church describes this scene. Stephen, right before he is stoned to death. From Acts chapter 7. But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. Did you hear that? Whew. Refusal to obey. Rejecting God in their hearts, turned back to Egypt. Church, sin always begins in the heart. No matter what behaviors manifest, even to the point of making God's people a laughingstock to a watching world, sin always begins in the heart. Idolatry always begins in the heart. Idolatry for us today is more subtle and thus perhaps more dangerous. For us, it's when a good thing becomes a God thing. It could even be your kids, job, career and calling, money or your health. I defined idolatry early in this, earlier in this series as when we say, Jesus is great, but what I really need is dot, 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 blank. And whatever you choose to fill in the blank with, that is your idol. But that definition can also have a bit of a flat side because perhaps you don't find yourself saying that in your heart. We had a good discussion on this in our home group that Sunday, and I loved how one person articulated it another way, in a more helpful way, I think. She said, idolatry is when I say, 
I can't be happy without a certain situation changing in my life. Whether it's financial security, good health, good relationships, or whatever. I wonder what that certain situation might be for you. And say, I'll never really truly be happy until I get that thing. Church, let's search our hearts and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal these subtle forms of idolatry. So that was scene number one. Now cut scene and let's look at scene number two. And don't worry, not all 10 scenes will have equal time in this sermon. Some of you are already a bit nervous. Now we're with the Lord and Moses on top of the mountain. And what becomes clear right away is that God knows exactly what's going on. God sees and knows. Sister or brother in Christ, are you engaged in some kind of private sin right now and you are under the illusion that no one knows? Let's not be deceived. We've all been there. But let's not become a laughing stock by remaining under that lie. God sees. God always sees. God always knows. Your sin will find you out. Are you engaged in certain behaviors online with fake or real people and you've deceived yourself into thinking that you're alone? No one can see. My friend, God knows. God sees, and yet he still loves you. He's calling out to you in love to repent, to turn from your sin, even right now through my words. And so God reports to Moses what they've done. The Lord says that they have become corrupt and quick, notice that, quick to turn away from what he's commanded them. They are stiff-necked, verse 9, meaning stubborn and disrespectful. And God's righteous anger will come against them in punishment. Though, as God says there in verse 10, He will make Moses into a great nation, thus remaining true to His covenant. But verse 11, notice this. Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. This is prayer number one of really noteworthy prayers from Moses to the Lord in this entire story. In this amazing bold prayer, let's consider what Moses says. He recalls what the Lord did to bring his people out of Egypt. In verse 12, he pleads on behalf of the reputation of God. Notice, he doesn't dispute, and in fact, he doesn't know yet that the people have become a laughingstock to their enemies. But God, why should your reputation be harmed? It's not as if God had forgotten his covenant at all, but Moses still calls on God to act differently in light of the covenant to their ancestors. Here's the thing. As we've said, God could have preserved Moses and still eventually raised up those descendants to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And by the way, what a temptation for Moses. I mean, imagine that temptation to, to ego and being grandiose, like, yeah, start over with me. Make, make a great nation out of me. But no. Notice what Moses is doing in part in this prayer. He is standing in the gap on behalf of a sinful people, not thinking of himself, but thinking of God's covenant people, and most importantly, thinking of God. Now, this short little passage here can raise lots of questions for us. Scripture is clear that God does not change his mind like some fickle human being. But the power of the stories that God gives us 
reveal the beautiful dance that the Lord has with his people. From the text, it certainly seems like Moses' bold and audacious prayer has an impact. So in this brief takeaway, I hope we get from, this is what I hope we get from these, for these few verses here. Our sovereign Lord indeed does not change his mind in fickle ways. It's not like he's just dead set on this and Moses prays and God's like, oh, okay, I accept. No, God's ultimate plan is certain and sure. But in this beautiful mystery and gift of prayer, we see throughout scripture that God has determined to accomplish his purposes through the prayers of his people. And in this conversation, in this prayer, we see this beautiful dance, this dramatic tension of where Moses intercedes and God's plan comes to fruition. Oh, that that would astound us, LVC, and lead us to a deeper life of prayer. What a gift to be able to partner with God through these kinds of real, bold, relational prayers. We may not have the position of Moses. Not even I can say that fully. And yet each of us as new covenant Christians have the ability to approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that God's purposes will come to pass. Now, cut scene and on to scene number three. So now look in your print or digital Bibles still in chapter 32. So Moses now heads down the mountain with God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, written on stone. And while he's carrying that weight, he must also be carrying a sense of relief. But keep in mind, he has yet to see the scene for himself. So after a brief conversation with his apprentice, Joshua, Moses sees what's going on and he explodes there in verses 19 and 20. Although we learn later that God is in fact slow to anger, Moses is not. The stone tablets that God wrote on with his very finger, Moses throws to the ground, dashing them, into pieces. And think about this. It's like a symbol of how the people had broken that very law. And then listen to what he does. This is intense, in part because it must have taken a lot of deliberate time. He takes this golden calf, burns it in the fire, and then grounds it into powder. He then scatters it on the water and makes the Israelites drink it. Now, out of two million or so people, we're not told exactly how many were involved in this idolatrous sin. And it's not exactly cl clear if the whole water supply is affected. But this symbolic action, the symbolic power of this action is clear. The remains of this golden calf that they had bound down to would now be coming out of their bodily waste. Friends, Moses is acting in explosive anger here. But as God's appointed leader in this specific context, I think the divine message is clear and right. This is what sin is like to God. Whether them or us, the sinfulness of sin can be symbolized like this. Just as we are rightly repulsed by human waste, fecal matter, that is what sin is like to God. As Pastor Isabella said last week, a holy God says to our sin, you shall not pass. And as that fake and false God literally passes through their system 
and out of their bodies, I wonder what was going on in their hearts. Cut scene on to scene number four. Now it's time to confront Aaron. What a pregnant question from Moses in verse 21. What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Like, Aaron, did they torture you or something? What in the world, brother? Like, literally, brother. Because you led them into such great sin. Now, we have to take a few moments to read in full and consider Aaron's response. In part because of what it teaches us about the gravity of the sin that had overtaken them all. But also what it teaches us about godly leadership or the lack thereof. Still in chapter 32, verse 22. Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Are you kidding me? Just, whoa, voila, look at this, a calf. Look, I think as the reader here, we are meant to laugh here. This is so pitiful, it's laughable. It's tragic and sobering, but it seems like one of those times where God's inspired word uses humor to make a point. For Aaron to think that Moses might actually believe him is both pitiful and laughable. Remember, the inspired narrator, likely Moses, told us that Aaron fashioned it with a tool. Now, I'm no artist, but I can imagine that took a lot of time, care, and planning. The people were running wild and out of control, but oh, how deep Aaron's sin is here, especially as the leader of God's people. Church, let's beware of the deceitfulness of sin. We can rightly look at this example of Aaron and think of world leaders in our day and age who they create alternative truths and realities and then have the audacity to argue as if it's true. Maybe even a few this week. Oh, the deceitfulness of sin. Look, it could be that Aaron is is merely a faker here, just a total liar. But the sinfulness of sin, as revealed in Scripture, teaches us how it begins in the heart. I think it's likely that Aaron was so deceived by this sin that deep in his heart, he actually believed that he was free of any responsibility. Shameless. And so friends, let's not just critique leaders. What about us? Does your life revolve around mostly listening to your heart? Do you realize that your own heart can deceive you? The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things. And I think we know deep down that's true. You can lie to yourself. And your own self spirals downward to believing that lie more and more to the point that you not only create your own reality, but you begin to argue strongly for it. Oh, beloved church, may the Holy Spirit of God so convict us to reveal the deep places of our hearts And give us the courage to be honest with ourselves and with others. LVC, pray 
for us pastors and elders. Spiritual leadership is hard. And so in some ways, I have empathy for Aaron. I should not laugh long, knowing how weak and broken I am. And yet pray for us. Because even though we, as pastors and elders, should not have the audacity to to think of ourselves as a kind of Moses, indeed, we have been called to lead. And so even though we're not given the identical role, role to those like Moses and Aaron did, may we never lead like Aaron did in this local church. What kind of leadership did he display? His leadership was essentially saying, you tell me where you want to go and I'll help you get there. But godly, new covenant leadership in the church says, based on God's word, we believe this is the direction to go. Will you come with us? Oh, there's so much more we could say here, but let's, Let's move on. So cut scene, and now scene number five. In light of the people's and Aaron's sin, Moses, God's representative for his covenant people, takes drastic action, starting there in verse 25. He draws a proverbial line in the sand, and the Levites rally to him. Then, speaking for God directly, Moses commands these Levites to take up a sword, go through the camp, and kill, even if it's family, friend, or neighbor. 3,000 of the people died. And by this action, the Levites are said to be set apart for the Lord and blessed. I wonder what you're thinking right now. Are you confused? Perhaps troubled? If so, you're not alone, and it's understandable. Whenever human life is taken, even by divine command, we should at least be sobered, if not troubled. This is serious business. In fact, as a preacher, I'd be more concerned if anyone was blasé about this, like, yeah, you know, whatever, or worse, scornful about this. Like, yeah, take that. You get what you deserve. And yet we need to take the text seriously. And we need to take the God of the text seriously. And so in light of this, a few things to keep in mind and consider. In case you were confused, yes, God did relent and not bring about the disaster to completely wipe them out. But through Moses and the Levites, he does carry out this punishment. And in fact, later, he strikes the people with a plague. Now, again, the passage is not totally clear about who. We're talking about a total population of around 2 million people, and here 3,000 people are punished by death. So we're not sure if they were the ringleaders or the only ones who were bowing down and partying around this golden calf. So out of 2 million people, actually a relatively small amount, and yet 3,000 people are a lot of people made in the image of God. But see, that's the key issue. This is God's image we're talking about. And so I think if we're to take God's word seriously, as much as it may sober us and trouble us, at the end of the day, we're led to ask the question that I've asked before. Does God have a right to take life? If so, when does God have the right to take that life? Does the creator, the author of life, have a right to take life as he sees fit in alignment with his purposes? I think the answer is certainly yes. But it may also be helpful to consider 
Have you ever created anything? A piece of art, a sculpture, a piece of music, something in your home, maybe even as a little child created something. If so, as the creator of that thing, what right do you think you had to that thing? My guess is you would say you had the right to do with it whatever you wanted. It's yours. Now, we would be rightly concerned about a creator, an artist, who in a fit of emotional rage destroyed their artwork. But back to God, if we look closely at all of Scripture, that is not the picture of God that we get. In regard to how God uses people in His plan, of course, as we have considered before, we know clearly from Scripture that as a church in the New Covenant, the New Testament church, we are not called to be used by God in the same way as Old Covenant Israel. In our now spiritual battle, the only sword that we ever take up is the sword of the Spirit the Word of God. And God's holy, infallible Word is clear that all of us have sinned in idolatrous rebellion against this good and just God. And in fact, we all deserve to be blotted out. If you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ and repented of your sin, this is indeed bad news. In this ancient story of God and his people, it's like a mirror that's held up in front of us and we can all see ourselves. We're all guilty. And yet as we turn now to the good news that ultimately finds fulfillment in Jesus Christ, I pray that you would see your utter need to be made right with this holy God. Oh, if you want to know more about that, come Come talk to any of us who've been up here in the front today or or talk to the person next to you, the person maybe who who brought you here today. There's no conversation that I would rather have after this service. And so God's word tells us, all of us, that atonement for sin is needed. And so that becomes Moses' next audacious conversation with the Lord. So cut scene on to scene Number six, did you know that God has a book? Yep, God has a book. The Lord has a book. And so right here, I want to pause the video a bit to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ. Those who have believed in the atonement that God provided through that greater Moses, Jesus Christ. Because of that simple faith, Your name is in God's book. Jesus says himself, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. When you're having a bad day, can you believe and even ask for the faith to believe that your name is written in heaven? Oh, LVC, may that take our breath away. Holy Spirit, shake us out of our worldly, distracted stupor to even for a moment grasp how profound that truth is. Here in the scene, we see this amazing prayer, yet again of Moses, to now, this time, ask for God to forgive their sin, but if not, to blot him out of the book that God has written. Even though he is completely innocent of that sin, Oh, if only Moses could have known, did he even have a clue that he was ultimately pointing forward to a greater mediator, the greater substitute to come, to the perfectly innocent one who would do whatever it took to provide atonement for his people. Well, God makes clear that he will punish sin, but he does not ultimately give the people what they deserve. Now cut scene, and the scene seven and eight all combine and summarize them briefly. 
In two conversations with Moses, starting in chapter 33, the holy God reaffirms his covenant with this unholy, stiff-necked people. In church, in many ways, the overarching question in this entire book of Exodus is how can a holy God dwell amongst unholy people? And yet Moses desires an even deeper intimacy with the Lord. He longs to have the Lord's presence. And in a powerful scene that we could dissect for some time, Moses asks to see God's glory. The one who had God's presence appear to him in a burning bush is hungry for more. The Lord causes all of his goodness to pass in front of Moses and he proclaims his name, perhaps the very thing that Moses longed to hear. And as that sovereign God, he affirms that he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and he will have compassion on whom he will have compassion. The Lord, he is God. And so then this God with everything that has happened calls Moses to come up once again to this powerful but intimate mountaintop. So then we come to cut scene and on to scene number nine. But actually here, I want to fast forward the tape. Anybody remember how we used to do that? The actual tapes that we would fast forward? Well, anyway, fast forward the tape. For those of you who don't understand what that means, don't worry about it. And I'll tell you what happens in scene number 10 in chapter 34, verse 29. And then we'll come back to scene nine and in there. You with me? Tukopomoja? So jumping ahead to scene number 10, Moses, after another 40 days and 40 nights, comes back down the mountain with new tablets of stone written with the covenant law of God. The key thing about this whole story, how this whole story ends, and how it sets up the rest of of the giving of God's law in Exodus and Leviticus is this. Remember how the people viewed Moses at the start of this story? This fellow Moses? Well, now, because of Moses' time in the very presence of the living God, his face is actually radiant to the point where he needs to veil it. Otherwise, the people are afraid to come near him. But Moses would call the people to him, speak God's law to them, and then continue on for the rest of his life, speaking to the Lord his God, the one whose name became so very precious to him. So let's go back to scene number nine. While on that mountain of fire and intimacy, God comes to Moses and proclaims his name. Listen to these verses from chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Friends, someone has called these verses the riddle of the Old Testament. Why a riddle? Because how can this compassionate and gracious God who is slow to anger and abounds in love and faithfulness, forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin, and yet this same God does not leave the guilty unpunished. How does that make sense? How does that work? This is how. This is how. God himself in Jesus Christ stood in our place as one guilty, as one condemned. This greater Moses did something that Moses could never do, uniquely offer himself as the perfect substitute for sinners. 
Listen to what the prophet Isaiah wrote hundreds of years after Moses and hundreds of years before Jesus. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Church, we've come to the end of our series entitled Redeemed to Worship. Do you indeed know that redemption? That no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what you've gotten yourself into, you can be set free from slavery to sin and death. Our God is worthy to be worshipped. Are you drawn to your idols but also find yourself repulsed by them? Again, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, the one in whom this holy God is most clearly revealed, I wonder what you make of all this talk about idolatry. You may not be worshiping idols of gold, but is your idol yourself? Understand, all of us in our very nature have the tendency to say, I will not worship anyone. I get to decide what is good, true, and right. No one can tell me that. If that's you this morning, we would humbly submit to you one day that idol of self-obsession will come crashing down. Let it come crashing down at the feet of Jesus, the one who knows you better than you know yourself, still loves you and showed it by giving his life for you. For all of us here today, come to the creator, redeemer, and lover of your soul, of your whole life, and see those idols for what they are in the light of his glory, his all-consuming fire. Rebellious idolatry will not have the last word. Rebellious idolatry will not stop God's plan for his covenant people. Beloved, flee from idolatry because of the Lord's gracious compassion. Know his offer of forgiveness and his abundant love and faithfulness to you. He is the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, you are gracious and compassionate. Lord, what more can we say about this good news? So, Lord, once again, take this ancient story and weave it deep into our hearts to rid us of our idols. Free us from slavery to sin and death. And turn our eyes to you, Lord. Turn our eyes upon Jesus and may the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing now about this Lord who is gracious and compassionate. So rise. Gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. I'll sing that one more time. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, 
slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. And the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. One more time, the Lord is good to all. And the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. Far as the east. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. And the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. As far as the east, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. My soul, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. Look. Realize you can't do heart surgery on yourself. Isn't that kind of a silly idea? You can't do heart surgery on yourself. And if, if you feel like this holy God revealed as the Lord who's gracious and compassionate, most clearly revealed in Jesus, is inviting you instead to just put yourself on that surgeon's table and let him do that heart surgery. Do that business with the Lord today. Come talk to any of us who've been up here. We would love to pray with you. We're not going to judge you, condemn you. We want to pray with you, talk with you, weep with you. Our prayer team will be over in that corner there. You can see the signposts. If you'd like to pray with anyone, that prayer team is also there. Visitors, again, we'd love to meet you. Do come see us over at the welcome table, which is right in front of tea. We know it's cold, church. The sun's gone down, so go get a cup of hot tea and meet someone new. Remember, if you saw someone new around you, it's your job to, to greet them and welcome them to our church family. It's great to have all of you here. Um, also, please don't leave the, the song sheets laying around. Uh, please put them in a rubbish bin or, or take it with you. Uh, I feel like I'm forgetting something. All right, women, remember about the walk into our freedom. It's going to be great. Go over there and have a good time together. The church receive now this benediction. Go into what may be another chilly week, following this God who is an all-consuming fire, one who is gracious and compassionate. Go and follow him, fleeing from your idols, 
letting him do that work in your heart and know that he is for you and he is with you and he loves you. Go in his power and go in peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Hope to see you next week.